Good evening, church family. It's good to be with you this evening. Uh, I want to share a few thoughts uh, uh, that I've been having recently uh, and kind of give you a glimpse of what our street is like here in University City. Uh, I live in uh, the heart of U, U City. I live uh, in, a uh, in and among a thriving and large Jewish population. And it has been incredibly informative and really cool to learn more and more. And ever since the pandemic started, uh, I've gotten to know my neighbors even better because what the interesting thing is we're at home and our kids are stir crazy and they want to go outside. And so they end up playing together and then we get to know the parents. And it's just been such a really cool, <clears throat> really cool experience. And recently the house next door to us uh, sold and a uh, family moved in. It's a Jewish family. They have a bunch of kids. So it's really loud over here now. And it's really great. And uh, it's just, you know, it's just a lot of excitement happening. My boy likes to play uh, with, with our neighbors. It's just a beautiful thing. Um, and the uh, and my next door neighbor is a chaplain at a local hospital, at BJC actually. Um, and it's been cool to kind of chat with him kind of about like religious matters, right? As, uh, as both religious leaders in our communities. And he and I were sitting, um, sitting down the other day and we're, we're talking about symbolism. We're talking about the concepts of, of symbols in, in our faith traditions. And we were talking about the rainbow because a few days previous, there was a massive rainbow, a beautiful and brilliant and bright rainbow. And he was wondering if the Christian tradition thought the same as the Jewish tradition. And I said, well, if your tradition says that the rainbow is the symbol and the example of God's promise to not to flood the earth again, then yeah, we would have the same, the same thing. And he said, yeah, yeah, of course, that's what, that's what we believe as well. Um, but it's also more, it's, it's deeper than that. And I asked him, I said, well, well, how so? And he said that when we see the rainbow, it, it does remind us of God's faithfulness. And it reminds us of God's faithfulness through some of the darkest times in our world. And he said, believe me, the Jewish community, the Jewish people have felt the depths of the darkness in our world. He said, but it also reminds us that the work is not done, that there's still evil in the world, and there's still good to be done in our days. It's not over. And I was, I was floored by this, uh, intrigued by this, confused, but excited. And this was such a, a beautiful example, uh, a beautiful description of, of the rainbow. And, and, and the, the way he speaks of it, it rings true the more and more I read of God, read God's word. Uh, I've been reading Esther recently, or I, I read through Esther and, and Nehemiah before that. And I think this tension rings true, even in those moments. If you remember, Esther is, is functionally an explanation of why the Jewish people have a, a, a celebration called Purim, which uh, a Jewish neighbor of mine described it as, think Halloween, but Jewish and lots of good food. And I'm like, oh, okay, that sounds like a good, that's like a legit holiday. So, um, so this, uh, this festival was created because of the rescuing and the, and the protection of the Jewish people in the time of Esther, where uh, Haman uh, tried to exterminate, basically, to, to, to cause, uh, to, to take out the Jewish people in, uh, in uh, Xerxes' land. And so, um, this is a celebration of God's faithfulness and protection. And in the story about how Esther, this, this adopted daughter of Mordecai, cousin of Mordecai, uh, became uh, this, uh, this brave, uh, faithful uh, woman of the Lord that helped protect uh, their people. But I think it's really interesting to me, um, the end of the story. So spoiler alert, things happened really well. They protected the people. It all worked out. Um, the festival is being enacted. And here in, in chapter 9, verse 22, it says this. It says, he, Mordecai, told them, the Jewish people, to celebrate these days with feasting and gladness and by giving gifts of food to each other and presents to the poor. This would commemorate a time when the Jews gained relief from their enemies, when their sorrow was turned into gladness, and when the mourning into joy. 
Um, there is so much beauty in this one verse. Uh, I love the when their sorrow was turned into gladness and their mourning into joy. It's, uh, it's beautiful when God can can take those things. He takes the bad things in our days and he can He can bring good in, in many of it uh, and much of it. Um, yet in the final verse, it was very interesting, speaking of, of this tension, and it says this is the last verse in Esther, in chapter 10. It says, He, Mordecai, was very great among the Jews who held him in high esteem because he continued to work for the good of his people and to speak up for the welfare of all their descendants. And here, I think, is the tension. We feel this again in Nehemiah. There's, there's this call to festival, and that's what you get the, the festival shelters and, and all this, um, all those, all the interesting festivals that, that, that come about. They come about of God's faithfulness and remembering who God is. Sometimes I think we might have lost a little bit of that remembrance uh, in our days. Um, but there's this tension. There's this tension that we, um, there's this importance in celebrating God's faithfulness that, that the work, but the work isn't done. And as, and as followers of Jesus, though, we, we know this all too well. We live in the already, but not yet, where we know um, of the good news of Jesus and the redemption brought by his life, death, and resurrection and ascension. We, we know it, yet we're often overwhelmed by the brokenness that surrounds us. Because both the things are true and real. It is real that God is faithful and that he is good and that he loves us and that he is, he is here with us. But it's also true that there is work to be done, that there's more, that restoration is coming, that, that, that it is not the way it's supposed to be still. And my encouragement is to live in the tension. We can struggle in some ways to only want to live kind of pie in the sky mentality. And then some of us will, will struggle in the morose side of it and, and only be about the sadness. Um, but there is a tension that we live in. The tension where we love, we learn to celebrate, to love and to relish in the goodness of and the faithfulness of our Lord. And yet we also lament and weep. We, we pray for restoration and we are restorers of broken things. And we don't, grow, we don't grow weary in doing good. This is the call of the disciple. This is the call of who we are as those who follow Jesus. And this is a really difficult time uh, for, for all of us in, in many different ways. And we live in this tension of, of, of God's faithfulness and then the reality of where we are. And so I want us to, to ask for God's strength. You know, may God, may the Lord give us strength and discernment to both celebrate his faithfulness if we're, for all the world to see, right? That we would celebrate who he is because he is, he has done great things and he loves us. And that we would also be a blessing to the hurting and broken people, places, and things in our world. This is our call. So may it be so. Let us pray together, friends. Almighty God, give us what we need to do your will in our days. Or be with us this evening. And let us recognize and remember where you have been faithful. And also, Lord, give us a greater imagination for the restoration that is at work through you in the world. So give us rest, strengthen us, we pray, that we may be salt and light in our days. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's good to see you, friends. It's good to be with you. Looking forward to worshiping together on Sunday. See you.